Hello and welcome to this Google Hangout on Air, the NMC Horizon Report 2013 K-12 edition. Consider, connect, collaborate. The NMC Horizon Report 2013 K-12 edition is a product of the New Media Consortium's Horizon Project, an ongoing research effort that examines emerging technologies for their potential impact on and use in teaching, learning, and creative inquiry within education around the globe. The report is a collaboration of the New Media Consortium, the Consortium for School Networking, and the International Society for Technology and Education, and is generously funded by HP. So we've talked about the technologies expected to become mainstream in K-12 practice in the next 12 months. The Horizon report also points to uh, some technologies that will become more mainstream more in the next two to three year horizon. So Tom, let's turn to you. Congratulations on your new position at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, and until recently, I know you were at Enrico County Public Schools in Virginia where I've heard a lot about the impressive work you were doing with open content there. Uh, you told me you have a fairly open view on the definition of open, so uh, tell me and the rest of us more about that and uh, what you have seen in your work. All right. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, I'll uh, try and breeze you through this, starting from where we were in Henrico County and, and are now, for that matter. Uh, Henrico County is in a fairly unique position. It's a fairly large district, about 49,000 students, um, about 40% economic deprivation, you know, majority, minority, all that sort of stuff. And I think what is fairly unique about Henrico is we've had a one-to-one -one laptop initiative in 6 through 12 since uh, about 2001. So when it comes to open educational resources we've been playing around with this uh, on the margins and making some real gains for, for quite a while. Now David Wiley is one of the big people on this and this is a an open educational resource essentially since I took this picture at one of his presentations and licensed it under Creative Commons. And really uh, Dr. Wiley's definition of OER is any kind of teaching material, textbooks, syllabi, lesson plans, videos, da, 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 uh, that allows you to do the following, free and unfettered access, and then free permission to engage in the four R's, which remix, you know, all that sort of stuff. But what I would like to argue is that almost from the start, we're ending up in a, in an place that you don't necessarily want to be. A lot of things designated as educational are kind of this, gross pre-chewed food. You know, we, we, we uh, have this beautiful media landscape out there and I think it's important that we take advantage of the exciting things that exist uh, in their unchewed state. I think, and that's a big part of this. So for instance, this is an image from uh, the Commons and Flickr, the Flickr Media Commons, it is an invitation card to an execution. You know, there's there's really exciting stuff out there, primary source material that is just just readily available. This came to me uh, because not only do I kind of browse through the Flickr Commons at times, but I've also subscribed to the feed of content from there. So this RSS feed kind of throws all this different media content through a filter where I can kind of chop off the, uh, or, or siphon off the cream, so to speak. There are so many exciting places out there to find really great uh, open educational resources, although they may not be focused on that kind of educational market in the way we typically think about it, but I think that's part of what makes them good and interesting. This, for instance, is the Internet Archive, which has an insane amount of content, but in particular I found it really interesting historically and in terms of English and sociology and psychology for that matter, being able to breeze back through and see television commercials from the 50s and 60s, you know, from drive-in theaters. There's all sorts of content in here that's really beautiful and exciting. That's kind of a raw material piece, but there's also some really exciting stuff going on in the media that I think we can gain from. This is a, a comic called XKCD, but it's a comic around math and physics, and each week he does a, a really exciting physics problem, like the idea that if you stir tea, 
kinetic energy could you actually heat up your tea by spinning so he breaks down all the different uh, possibilities there in a really humorous and interesting way but it's just out there ready to be used in all sorts of ways um, on the open web and I think the other thing that that is exciting is the multimedia and the sophistication there is growing as well this is uh, some local Virginia historians uh, President Ayers of the University of Richmond and a couple other guys from uh, University of Virginia but they do a podcast um, that focuses on the three tiers of uh, 18th, 19th, and 20th century history with a particular topic. In this case, Columbus and American memory. And not only do they interview uh, experts, they do it in a really humorous and engaging style. And then they give you different uh, possibilities in terms of resources, the transcript, the musical annotations, all here for free and available to you to use. And that's kind of the media side of things. I think it's also really exciting to see the tools that are available uh, and how that starts to bridge the gap between consumption and construction and in interaction. If you've ever seen Hans Rosling's uh, stories using this, uh, this tool called Gapminder to start to analyze you know, historical trends in terms of economics and infant mortality. Like This is just an amazing tool and one that you can get access to in terms of uploading your own data through Google Spreadsheets. You also have um, opportunities like this. This is just a custom map I built in Google Maps. Uh, to start to talk about U.S. history and to make it a more multimedia and engaging experience. So we've had, you know, fourth, third graders creating maps like this that are collaborative, online, and interactive in a lot of different ways that enable you to get at different kinds of understandings. And it's important to realize that there's a larger community around here building these sorts of things. Google Lit Trips is Google Maps, uh, it's kind of works of literature portrayed through Google Maps and this is available here where you can drill down and start to see you know you've already got all these as raw resources that are available to use in your classroom right now but you also have the potential down the road to make your own or to customize the ones that you bring. I think it's also important to look at the energy people are putting into things that you could then use in the classroom. This is a, a blog called Shorpy, but it's just a guy who scans historical photographs in and puts them online. And I think what's also exciting here is he'll challenge the community when he doesn't know certain things about a photograph and seeing people come together and do historical research to determine, you know, where was this? Who were those kids? That sort of thing. And being able to see, like, some of that passion and interest in in history they are live in addition to using these sorts of resources and there are similar ones for things like science this is fresh photons you know that's focusing on microscopic images at this point and all sorts of other things but these are just people out there in the wild doing exciting things that teachers are able to use all their energy think of them kind of as unpaid interns who are harvesting the red for all sorts of uh, the web for all sorts of exciting things? Even Reddit, which uh, often gets a bad rap in different environments, this is just a whole subreddit that colorizes historical photographs, which is a really exciting thing to have happening. You know, these people are putting really professional work into to making these photographs more what our, our students are used to seeing and it certainly makes them feel less like relics of the past and enables a different lens of analysis and interest. Um, so you got all this stuff going on online that's open, at least open in the sense right at the baseline of being easily accessible for your students and your teachers. So it's kind of how do you build workflows to make this work for them? And one of those things is like this is an RSS aggregator called Feedly, where I feed all the sorts of things I'm interested in in, you know, some of its image, some of its technology, some of its history. But I'm able to kind of parse through this fairly quickly and 
be able to skim that cream off and, and work it into my classroom and also forward it on to other people who might be interested in it. And this kind of is the next stage. We use Digo, which is social bookmarking, to help us aggregate this. So this is my own individual account. Um, but we joined a group with HBCPS ITRTs where multiple people can push this content here. And then other teachers could use it. In this case, this is a Spanish 2 group where other teachers are able to see what other people are bookmarking for resources and the specialist herself skims the top off and feeds it into a more curricular vetted content area. And we build that with things like WordPress. This is a kindergarten language arts curriculum laid out, um, but it's also feeding in her Digo bookmarks so that when she tags something as a K4, it comes into this blog as a post where people can comment and it's kind of a more traditional format that makes some people more comfortable. And then finally, you can also use open tools to aggregate open content in ways that change instruction. This is uh, our Henrico 21 site. It's dedicated to 21st century lesson plans. Um, so when teachers submit to this contest, which we run once a year, um, they have a templated format and it feeds into this blog so now it's widely available to the world not just our teachers but it is also you know put up here in a very visual way which enables rating voting different categorical elements and multimedia embedding of all sorts of stuff so this becomes the teaser they can full download both student artifacts and the full-on lesson plan in word format here but it's a way to create kind of an, an exciting community of learning built on an open tool and full of open educational resources that start to change instruction. Tom, thank you. I uh, think we were probably all taking notes. Those are awesome um, resources um, and I think really give us a good visual on um, some exciting elements to bring in to teaching and learning. So. Thank you for those. Um, I've got time for just a quick question. Uh, this could be an exhaustive conversation, but um, as you're working with um, teachers, what do you do to try to help them navigate you know, this mass of resources and be keen evaluators of, of material? How are they collaborating with one another? Kind of what's the direction you've given them? Well, I think it... it, it to a large extent, it's guiding them on an initial start and then coming up with workflows that allow different levels of view for different people. Because um, one of the key things is this content specialist involvement in seeing what's being used. Mm -hmm. Like this enables a whole other lens that was not possible before. And that's awesome. And it's even awesome if they're doing stuff you don't like. Like if you see they bookmarked that online workshop or worksheet that you didn't want them to use and lots of people went there and it's popular that opens up a whole nother conversation and so this is very valuable data even when it's not what you want to see so really our conversation is really uh, focused on showing great examples setting up workflows that make this possible and accessible because everybody's busy and overwhelmed so how do you make what you give them really really valuable and it's playing different people who are passionate and interested in different levels and different areas and, and using that energy to focus that value. Not everyone's going to do this, but mm -hmm. finding the people who will and using them to provision that more curricular, vetted, traditional type of aggregation, that's what you do. And I think that's where this is really exciting. Terrific. Thanks again for your remarks. In fact, thanks to each of you for letting us benefit from the practical suggestions you've given us drawn from your experiences um, with some of these emerging technologies in the Horizon Report. Um, before we conclude today, I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes in, and avail myself of your expertise in another area. I think the Horizon Report can be a real springboard for conversations with local stakeholders about um, some of these emerging technologies and their potential to impact teaching and learning. But I'm curious for many of you, how do you start the conversation with your local stakeholders? How do you bring them into the process of investigating new technologies that might um, help to solve problems or local needs that you have? As a technology leader, how do you facilitate 
discussion around emerging technologies um, to tackle the big problems facing your district? Any of you? Vicki, I think uh, some of it is determining what the what the goals are or what the problems are and then looking at really concrete examples of how those have been solved or achieved by others, be they within the district or without. But if, if there's one thing that's really beautiful, it's, it's those prime examples and pointing people at it and having very specific discussions. Uh, one of the things we found to be key was it's easy to say something like 21st century skills and pretend we agree on what that means or, you know, student uh, engagement. Like these words are so big and have so many nuances of understanding, you better get your vocabulary straight and some agreement on what you're talking about before you go down these paths or that just leads to frustration and anger. So really defining what the purpose is, what that word means, and then looking at examples and really breaking down how do they get there, what would we do, how does that fit within our culture. So that's that's a continuous cycle for us. I like that, breaking it down, breaking it mm -hmm. down. And if you haven't already done so, done so, download the report and toolkit now and use the feedback form to let us know how you're using the